Hello and welcome to another Desk of Lady Ada. We're from the future, teaching you the future about <laughs> electronics, future generation that may have a Brother P Touch <laughs> thermal label printer um, and they need to repair it. And that's what we're going to be doing tonight. I'm going to take a little bit of break from designing new stuff or writing code or doing layout. And I thought, um, well, actually, I, I brought this home because we have like all these cameras. You can't see them because like, you're in the camera, but I can see the camera, and all these cameras have slightly different HDMI outputs that when we put them into the, um, the video mixer software, basically, we need to know exactly the resolution and the time clock that they use, and one's like 1080i, 5994, and one is like 720p25, and they're all slightly different, and so we wanted to label them because uh, every time we set up the software, we have to remember. We also want to label the cables, like which HDMI cable goes to which. Basically, it's like an AV fun house here, and nothing works better than a label maker to fix it up. And so um, at the Adafruit, the factory, I was looking through, uh, you know, we use label makers all the time for labeling reels and stuff. And it came across this, which was kind of labeled broken. And I was like, ah, you know what? I bet I can fix it. And uh, so can you. Uh, it's it not too difficult to fix household electronics. I'm gonna, uh, I started to fix this at home because, you know, I brought it home and I was, I was noodling around with it. And I was like, ah, you know what? I'm going to do this live because it, this is one of the things that you don't learn in school. I don't learn it anywhere. You have to just kind of do it. I'm going to show kind of what to look for and some common things that uh, break low-cost household electronics. So let's, uh, let's get right to it. And we're going to go to overhead cam. So uh, here we are. This is the, the label printer. And um, normally, if you press the uh, go button, the little red button, uh, stuff appears. And nothing's appearing. Sad. So. Um, we're going to figure out why that is. Um, I'm, I did buy this a long time ago, and basically there's two ways to power it. You can power it from a 9-volt adapter, a little DC plug, or you can power it from batteries. So, you know, could be the batteries are dead. So let's, let's check out the batteries. That's the first thing you want to do, in my opinion. So I'm going to grab all these batteries, and if you have a battery tester, great. If you don't, your everyday multimeter will also do the job. Make sure it's in DC voltage mode, and then uh, make sure your stuff's not tangled up, and um, okay, stay still. You know, 1.4, 1.5. Maybe I can line these up and I can do these all in a row. 1.45, 1.45, 1 1.45, 1.45. So these are actually all pretty good batteries. They're not super fresh. Super fresh would be 1.6, but 1.45 is still within reason. Alkaline batteries, you know, they're, they kind of die at 1.2. Um, so then we can look in here and you know, basically, uh, the reason this is working off batteries is that there's a little bit of corrosion in there. I don't know if you can see it. Do you want to, do you want to try going to the microscope cam? Good, good time to maybe try that out. Let me focus in on this. It's tough because it's two-dimensional. So you can see, hold on, let me grab my tweezers. This is a nice little spring. I mean, it's still corroded a little bit. You can, can see a little bit of corrosion, but this spring is at least shiny. But this spring is like super corroded, rusty. So yeah, I mean, like it's this is a common thing that happens. Batteries get left left in. There's some corrosion that occurs. Um, you know, if they get left out, some um, battery acid leaked out, corroded this, or something else. Um, and so you've got this non-conductive area. Now, if you have um, Ironically, you Coca-Cola or like vinegar, or something very acidic, you can use that to clean that off. I don't actually have any in the house, so I thought I would just sort of scrape at it. I'll see if I can can clean it off that way. 
So I'm gonna go back to the overhead cam. Hey, can you can uh, go back to the overhead cam? And I'm gonna grab. Second. This is not the best tool, but I can kind of maybe scrape at this. Uh, it's pretty corroded. So what I can do, and this is stainless steel, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to get some sandpaper or vinegar and really clean it off. I don't think I'm going to be able to just scrape because it's, it's really like, it's corroded all the way. I mean, it's okay, so well, at least we know why the batteries weren't working. Um, another thing we can do is we can, um, let's see, this piece is supposed to be, hold on, let me check the continuity. Because this is a, these pieces are all kind of connected together. So these are supposed to be connected together. So what I can do is maybe grab a piece of wire. I mean, I'm also not sure that the whole thing works at all, but you know, this way I can at least try to fix this part. And I can kind of, until I, I get a, you know, something to clean off the corrosion with, I can sort of jury rig my own wire contacts. Maybe I can shove this in there. I can also try soldering. I don't know if those are stainless steel or... Oh. It says you can use old school black and white TV tuner spray. Okay, yes, which I, which I definitely don't have. You can go to Radio Shack. You can go to Radio Shack and get that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So I just totally just jammed a piece of wire in there. Um, but you never know, maybe it'll work. So let's try that. I'll put these batteries in. Also, while you're at it, check all the other contacts. I mean, there's a little bit of acid in here. And also, like, again, it might not be the, the problem. Like I said, vinegar works good. Yeah, I know, we ha but we have no, we might ask earlier, I was like, hey, do you have any vinegar? And you're like, no, I don't have any vinegar. I'm like, I don't have vinegar. We don't cook with vinegar, but if you do, vinegar's awesome. I think I have, like, coconut vinegar or something, like, because I have some weird vinegar. Uh, we could try. We'll try it later. Anyways, um, remember we once fixed that bicycle up with a. Uh, was it? Uh, we used tin foil and, and Coca Cola. Yeah, that worked. That worked pretty well too. Okay, so. Oh, and so another thing that, by the way, because um, I've been caught by this before. Sometimes they're like, oh, well, why don't you just uh, connect up an external battery pack and wire it in? And um, not, I don't know if this one, this project, this product in particular, does this. But I've noticed um, a lot of products have little, um, I wouldn't call them safety interlocks, but they're like open case interlocks. So like these little switches and stuff, they might bump into a switch inside that won't let it turn on if this is open. So you might be like trying to like, you know, if you, you connect up to your benchtop power supply or something, you just clip it onto the wires. Um, it may still not work because it has to be able to close. So I don't know for sure if that, that happens, but so let's try. Okay. So it actually did come up, although well, it's really hard to uh, read. But it did come up, and you can kind of barely see the text. But it did turn on. Let me um, put in a, uh, I brought a um, labeled tape thingy. So let's see if this can print. So that's good. We got the battery working. Now, this will let me know if the whole thing works overall. But don't worry, we're not going to stop even if this does work. We're going we're gonna to continue on. Okay, so put this label maker in here. And then, okay, so, oh yay, look, a little 1080i. Okay, so that's great. Okay, so we know that overall it works and we figured out the, that battery problem. Um, However, uh, having used this thing, I know that it eats batteries. I mean, like, it, it'll basically die in about an hour of use with batteries. And um, yeah, I guess I could use rechargeables, but it, I don't use it that often. So what I'd prefer to do is actually plug it in to a nine volt uh, wall adapter. And um, 
you know, use that instead because that way I don't, you know, I only plug it in and I use it. I don't have to like carry this around and sit on my desk anyways. And I'm actually going to use this um, handy dandy thing that we just got in the store, which is kind of, I only use these now because I'm like so lazy. Um, they're USB to 9 volt mini boosters. And um, there's a little boost converter in here and it's like 85, 90% efficient. Um, it can draw, you know, it can supply up to an amp at 9 volts. It draws 2 amps from here. It's totally not USB spec compliant. Um, but boy, is it handy. And if you have a USB powered hub on your desk, which I do, it's, it's kind of nice. You don't have, like, basically, I don't have to reach under my desk anymore to plug in wall adapters. Um, and then, you know, you get them in 9 volt or 12 volt. So now let's plug this in and uh, plug this in. And I'm actually going to remove the. Um, Okay, I'm gonna, actually it turned off, so um, I know why, but I'm going to pretend like I don't know why. And I'm gonna remove, I'm gonna remove this and I'm gonna remove the battery so there's no question that it's being powered from the wall adapter. Okay, so we plugged in the wall adapter and definitely um, there's no batteries and it's, it's not working anymore. It's like, no, it's so sad, press the red button, nothing happens. Okay. I actually know something that I did wrong, but uh, this happens so often that I'm, I'm going to show you. Don't do what I just did, or you can, but this is why it doesn't work. This is one of the few weird electronics that doesn't use, oh man, I don't know if you can see it. It doesn't use DC positive center, it uses negative center. I don't know, can you, can they read the text? No, they can't. You can try zooming in, but it's white on white, which I hate. Hold on. Dude, they, oh, they totally made it illegible. Hold on. I'm going to, I'm going to block it out. Okay, okay, yeah, you can kind of barely see it now. Hold on. Yeah. There you go get it. And then I'm going to just black this out so this is readable too. It also makes it gother, which is cool. Um, so this is, and this happens so often. I don't know why they do this, but it is DC 9 volts in, but see how there's this little circle? That circle tells you that the ground is connected to positive and the center, the little center dot, is negative. So that's opposite from like 99.9% of DC wall adapters. I thought that was how the Space Navigator Guild does their logo. Yes, it's also, this is where the spice goes, okay? <laughs> I thought that's Insert how they the spice. without moving. Yes, this does look a little bit like some sort of weird hieroglyphs that we'd send into the Voyager um, <laughs> pr space probe, which was also apparently center negative. I hate center negative. I, I don't, you know, for some weird reason, this is center negative. There's no real good reason. It's made out of plastic, so it doesn't, it's not like, oh, is there some grounding issue, whatever. Um, and actually, you know, when I first brought this home, I, I plugged in center positive, didn't work, and I was like, no. Um, I plugged in center positive, I was like, oh, you know, I should just double check. I was like, oh man, it's center negative. So I don't have any uh, center negative power supplies in the store, and this cable is definitely center positive. I didn't want to cut it apart. So I made a patented device called the switcheroer. And the switcheroer, basically, I took a, a, a DC jack and a DC plug, and I uh, switched. Hold on. There you go. I, you know, connected plus into one to negative one, basically making a, a reverser. -er. And um, oh, come on, come on. lock. So okay. Do you want me to zoom out of this? Yeah, sure. I can. I'm, I don't think we have to zoom into the small text. So this basically is just a little thing that lets you switcheroo. So if you plug in the center positive here, then when you measure with your multimeter, oh, don't put it in continuity mode, um, it's now, uh, the center is negative, or if I, sorry, if I put in ground, you'll measure that it's nine volts with the center being ground. Switch a ruler. Anyways, I can, you know, later on make a custom cable, but you know what? This works pretty well, uh, especially for such a low voltages and low currents. Okay. So you plug this in, and you're, oh man, I'm just dropping everything. And, oh, now it's working. 
That's interesting. It wasn't working before. Hold on. I wonder if I accidentally fixed this. OK, now it's not working. Good. Sorry. It's flaky. Um, it does work once in a while when you plug it in, but it doesn't always work. And that's probably why it was uh, set aside, because first off, the, the batteries were corroded, so it wasn't running off batteries. And then depending how you plug it in, it turns on this time, but then if you like move the DC jack a even a little bit, it, it stops working. So if I hold it, okay, now I'm not gonna be able to get it to work. Basically, it's just like the DC jack's not working very well. So this is a good time to um, open it up and see what's up. Because I noticed that like sometimes it, you know, it didn't plug in. If I plugged it in again, it did work. So what's going on? Let's find out by opening it. And maybe we'll learn something. We're probably going to learn something. Let's give me, give me a hint. <laughs> um, so go to town with your screwdriver set. This is the most fun part. And then get everything opened. Do, 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 do. Is it all of them? No, I think I forgot this one. Hold on. No, I got that one. No, I didn't get this one. Hmm. What is, did I already strip it? I did need that screwdriver that fell off the table. This one's just a little bit smaller than the others. Okay. All right. Now we're talking. So gently remove. And I'm actually going to remove these batteries just because I don't want them to fall out of their own accord, which they're totally going to do. And then I'm going to close this, and I'll get the, keep the screws in place. And OK. So OK, so there's a little bit of cabling here. I'm going to remove this ribbon cable so I can split this open. So this ribbon cable was over here, and it wouldn't let me open it all the way. Um, you have a motor over here, and you have um, some gear system over here. This is you know, the, probably the, the pickup for the tape, and it, it does all the, the label itself stuff. Over here, there's a ribbon cable. This almost certainly goes to the LCD. There is um, a BA660L, a motor driver or something, because this ribbon cable goes to here. So it's probably some detector motor driver. Oh, sorry, this is the actual motor. So yeah, there's a little, maybe a motor driver here. Um, oh, when, when is us? I actually don't know how to pronounce this chip company name. When, when is us? When is us? I don't, when is us? Whatever. You know who I'm talking about. They make those chips. Um, there's some Chinese characters here, which is kind of cool. Maybe this is the LCD and this is, no, this is the um, keypad. Sorry, this ribbon cable is the keypad, and this is the LCD. Anyways, um, it's cool stuff. But what we're really interested in is this power supply area. So actually, I'm going to go to the microscope. Hold on, i got to reorganize a couple little things here. Just make some room. OK, I think I can shove this underneath the microscope. OK, so this is the DC power jack. So see, there's the, uh, can I tilt and show? No, I can't really tilt and show. Uh, you just believe me that this is the DC power jack into here. 
And here you can see this is a it's kind of a standard three prong power jack. And look right here. See this? Oh man. Oh man. See that? It's a hairline, hairline crack. But that's. Perfectly good electronics ruined because of this all the time. Yes. This happens. Every kid's toy break. <laughs> all the time. And the reason this happens, in particular, and I'll tell you the thing that drives me nuts about this, because this happens, and, and I know what happened here. Basically, the DC jack, either something was plugged in and it fell, or the, the DC jack was plugged in and it was strained, and, it, and this is the farthest corner. So these weren't flexed as much, but this, because the jack was flexed up and down a little bit, this here just like cracked. I can't imagine that when you go to the dentist and they see like a cavity, this is kind of what it looks like. It's just it's like, it's just this little, it's a little crack, but like once you know what to look for, you see it. Yeah. And you see it goes all the way around. So this is a flaky connection. And that's why sometimes you plug in the DC jack and I was like, oh, it's working. And sometimes you plug it in, depending on how it's tweaked, it won't work. But I'm just gonna take this apart too because I'm, I'm, I wanna show the rest of this. Because I'll explain why this happens because I can just tell by looking at the PCB that this is a one-sided paper phenolic board. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I hate one-sided paper phenolic boards, but they're so common. I mean, like I've seen full TVs made out of this I stuff. Think, I don't think the label makers, they've changed the design in like 10 years. Yeah, I mean, let's actually, let's go to the, um, let's go to the overhead. Yeah, this, this is the huge cat. Well, that's why it was like, it would work for a few seconds longer. And, I feel, can we zoom in a little bit? Because yeah. I want to I want to get into this section, but the microscope is a little bit too right, microscopy. Like this. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so I'll just have to hold this steady. So um, this is this power line goes to the, the main board. So this is actually the main power. This is a DC jack. This is the cheapest PCB you could probably make. I mean it's single sided, which I don't have a problem with single sided, although it means that you have less mechanical strength because you don't have the through hole plating that would have given this a little bit you know, more strength so it would be able to, to handle it. And also paper phenolic, they're just, they're just really brittle. You know, compared to FR4, which, is very, which has a lot of flex to it. And of course, you know, the main board is FR4. It's like that nice green FR4 and it's almost, I mean, it has to be double-sided. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's double-sided. I don't really want to take it apart. I'm pretty sure it's double-sided because I see vias. Um, so it, you know, it's double, maybe, maybe even four-sided, although I don't know, it doesn't look that complicated. Um, not four-sided, a four-layer. Um, but anyways, back to this. Uh, so you've got the DC jack here. You've got D2, it's a diode. So luckily if you did plug in, you know, the battery's wrong or you, um, you plugged in a positive, uh, center positive nine volt adapter, because everything in the world uses nine volt center positive except for this label maker. Um, so this is a protection diode here. You've got a big capacitor because there's a motor driver, maybe, you know, just in case you have a really crummy 9 volt. Um, not sure what this is, probably a drain resistor to, um, to drain the capacitor. Um, and then over here is F1, which is a fuse. Now, in this case, I'm pretty sure, you know, it's a PTC fuse, and so I'm not too worried about it. But in general, when you're taking apart an electronics or repairing stuff, um, the fuses tend to go. And you know, it's like it's it's kind of a, a known thing if you're repairing like you see like um, a stereo system on the street or or um, like you know a, a TV. I don't people don't really throw TVs anymore cuz they're well though maybe even an LCD or or a, a microwave. I remember it's like, "Oh, it probably works. The toaster oven works. The vacuum cleaner works. Just the fuse is broken." So while it's powered off, and don't forget to do while it's powered off. There's no chance of being powered. You should just measure the continuity of your, no, 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 this is great. I, I think this is fine, because it's gonna either beep or not. You'll hear the beep. Oh yeah, I wanna show that. Okay. Okay, here. Okay, so you got continuity. So, you know, it's fine. But I, and then kind of figured it was fine, because it, you know, it's, it's, it doesn't look like a one-time fuse, it looks like a PTC fuse, so it, I don't know why they would spend a little bit more money on that, maybe the fuse. Huh? Uh, plated holes or like little rivets, this paper phenolic stuff tends to pop apart even when you try to solder it. And then I hate paper. See, everyone hates paper. It dissolves. Yeah, and then someone wants to know, what's the function of the large cap? Like, why do they have such a big cap? 
They probably have um, a big capacitor. Well, let's see exactly what the capacitor is. It's a uh, 16 volt, uh, 3300 microfarad. Um, Do they make them smaller? They just bought like 8 billion of these in 1996? No, I think, I mean, I think that this is probably, so here's the deal. I mean, like, whenever you take apart low cost goods, Every decision is made for cost, you know? Like it's never, it's rarely made for usability. It's usually- a surplus of one billion of these. No, it's not that they have a surplus. It's, it's basically, this is what, capacitors are very low cost. Like even this big a capacitor is only like four or five cents. They're very, very cheap. Capacitors are super cheap, especially through hole capacitors. Um, you know, tantalum and, and ceramics get a little expensive, but electrolytics, they're, they're dirt cheap. You know, and like this is, this is like a generic brand too. This isn't, you know, like some, this is SMG, who knows? I mean, it's like, it, it's just a capacitor. It's like five cents. And so changing from, um, you know, this isn't even a high voltage board and like they could have, they could have gone to FR4, but it would have cost 20 cents probably more, maybe 10, 20 cents. They cheaped out there, but there is a motor here. And there, you know, if you look at the main board, there's no other capacitance on this. Not, no, nothing major. There's a couple, I see like a couple little yellow ceramics. Like there's a regulator on here. There looks like a 3.3 volt regulator, maybe a 5 volt regulator. And I see a ceramic cap there, but like honestly, and then a couple of 0.1 microfarads kind of scattered around. But there's no more large scale capacitance. So this is the entire capacitance for the board. And there's a motor. And on the back it said 6 watts. So this motor probably draws up to an amp when it's printing and they want to make sure that when this kicks in when the motor kicks in the um you know because it has to heat up and print i don't know if it's is it thermal i think it's thermal i don't know exactly how i'm assuming it's a it's a it's a thermal printing process but it might not be maybe oh no sorry it's there's an ink and it heats the ink onto it so it's like it's like transfer thermal i think um so when the you know whatever that is that that makes the ink transfer, that takes some power, the motor takes some power. They wanna make sure that they get rid of as much of the big ripples as possible because basically it's so cheap to add a gigantic capacitor. So that's why it's so big. And they had a lot of space. So I wish they'd gone with a nicer PCB, but it's not surprising that there's a gigantic capacitor considering there's a motor inside of there and they wanna make sure the, the LCD bias voltages are nice and clean while the motor's printing. They don't wanna see that weird flicker effect that you sometimes get when um, the voltage uh, raises and lowers. They did use paper phenolic also for the, um, for the keypad. So you can see this yellow, yellow um, PC material. So I'm gonna turn on my soldering iron and I'm actually going to change the tip out before I do that because I was doing some surface mount soldering but for this I actually wanna get a slightly larger tip. And since I can change out tips, why not? So change to a larger tip. I can show the nice big one since I'm going to be cleaning up that power jack. But cracked power jack connectors, cracked connectors. I mean, by the way, this is, you know, you can make fun a little bit of brother um, for having a, a, a cheap connector, but honestly, it is the bane of electronics. I mean, I remember the first iPods had the same problem. You remember like the first two or three iPods had uh, headphone jack issues. People would have to hold the headphone jack. They'd have to, because the, the headphone jack is exactly where all of the stress is happening. That and the 30 pin or Firewire or- The lightning cable still were the stress point. You, that's exactly what it's, and that's why they like, they made the cable so it's like a solid bar and then they, they have you know, tons of protection um, you know, inside and something, you know, the case is supposed to protect a little bit, but it's, you know, it's not the, the strongest case. And even if maybe it, it, it wasn't fully assembled as tight as possible. So there's a little bit of, of, um, slack. Anyways, we'll, um, we'll fix this up and see if that, uh, that solves it. Seems, seems a likely culprit. So I'm going to carefully put this like that. And then grab some solder, pardon me. And this is, you know, it's like if you have any soldering skills at all, like look, you can fix, this is like a $50 label printer. So by the way, um, 
if you do this, don't be surprised if you damage the PCB even more. Like these PCBs really, they're not meant to be soldered to, in which case you can solder a wire and you'd bridge a wire from the connector to um, a point. Because I'm just letting you know, like these, these PCBs, oh yes, he's like dissolving. <laughs> Whee! So I'll just, I'll just lift. I'll try to lift this off. Yeah, this is just coming apart. Yeah, I just heated it a little bit and you can see it just the PCB just came apart, and now you can just, it smells terrible. You can just see the connector is, is, is just floating there. Yeah. It's totally cool. We can survive. What we're going to do is I'm going to go to my old standby silicone wire. <laughs> One second, I'm going to grab a chunk of silicone wire. You can use stranded or, or solid core. I just happen to really like stranded silicone. So. Cut a piece. And you know one of the nice things, okay, so it, it sucks that this is a single-sided board and it's kind of like lame, but one of the nice things about single-sided boards is at least it's really, really easy to tell where it's supposed to connect to and from. So, tin this, tin that, and I'm going to just solder directly to the connector. And then I'm going to, uh, with luck, this should not dissolve too much. Just tack it onto there. Actually, I can. Uh, hold on, I'm gonna make this a little shorter so it doesn't jut out. So much. And okay. Well, we'll see how that does. Okay. So we're ready to put this back together now. So let's undo undo what we just did. So this, make sure you don't pinch any wires on the way back out. This screwdriver. No, sorry, it's, that's actually not the mounting hole. This is the mounting hole. Okay. And unfortunately now there's even a little bit less mechanical strength that doesn't have um, this pad. I mean, not that that pad provided any mechanical strength whatsoever, but it has even less now. If you're really worried, um, you can use some, you know, um, I wouldn't use hot glue, but super glue epoxy would really do the job. Put some epoxy here. Honestly, if this breaks again, I'll just like bring the wires out and connect an you know, external uh, DC adapter plug. I'm, I'm like that. But um, I think this will this will do, and I'll just be careful not to drop it. Okay. And um, I'm actually gonna take a risk. I'm not gonna put the screws all in yet. So I'm gonna hold on. I'm going to open this up and put this back in. And then use my reverse or twiddler. Yay! So now I can print out a label using wall power. Wait, hold on. Hertz is capitalized. Okay, so there you go. I got a nice little label printed out that I can put on this microscope so that we won't forget. <laughs> and that's the, uh, that's our repair. So let's um, just finish it up. And you can see it, it stays on for just like three seconds. I mean, that, that uh, 3300 microfarad capacitor, you know, when the motor isn't running, 
the electronics don't draw that much current, and so the capacitor can actually run the electronics for a couple seconds there, like about a second. Okay, so now we're just going to put it all together. And even though, you know, I could, I, I'm, I'll probably leave that little wire jig in there in case everyone want to run off batteries, but I think I'm going to stick to DC power. I kind of like DC power the most because I don't need to carry this around. It's just going to sit on my shelf, and then we're going to label all the wires here, and I'll just label stuff like the cat or my oscilloscope or something. Okay. So I'm getting close to the end. Is there any questions people had? Anything people want labeled? Um, well, folks were talking about this, but why do you want? Why do you need a fuse in a device like this? That's actually a good question. Um, well, I mean, there is a high-powered item in here. I mean, there is a motor. There's a motor driver. Um, you know, a, a fuse. I mean, first off, they're, they're they brothers are pretty big company, and. Um, they probably have a policy that every item has to have a fuse. Um, I mean, it's not a super high-powered item, but if it's running off of a wall adapter, there's a short inside. Um, you know, it, it could end up drawing like up to 20 watts. You know, if the motor, you know, windings fuse or something, or I don't know what what could possibly happen, but something happens and and there's a short, and and this could basically start smoking, and. Even though it's like not going to electrocute you, that's not what you have the fuse for, it, it will protect it from um, internal damage. That's a pretty good idea. It's also, I, I believe it's a, a, it looks like a PTC fuse. It's a fuse that um, if it overheats, it'll, it'll open and then it'll eventually start working again. And, and so it's, you know, if it's a, it's a temporary thing, it'll stop working and, and start working again. Um, I think it's like, you know, mostly for the quality of the goods you know, to make it so that there's no chance of it melting itself. Um, if you've ever used, I mean, like, you know, you've heard stories of, of people who have um, these hoverboards and, you know, when they're charging them, um, something gets damaged and, and there's so much current involved that it can actually start heating up and melting the plastic and, and causing a fire. I, there's not, I don't think that this, there's enough going on here that could draw that much current, but it's, it's always a risk. And fuses are really, really cheap. So there's there's pretty much a fuse in everything. It's 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 half half the design, half liability. I'd say. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, another question: If you don't have a fuse, kind of fuse breaks. What do you do? Well, um, the the bad idea that you should do to start is just you short it with a piece of wire, and then you just uh, plug it in. But you plug it in with your um, power, benchtop power supply so you can measure how much current is going in because it could be that the fuse blew for some, you know, especially glass fuses, if you have something with like a glass fuse, it can break for uh, just mechanical reasons. It got, it got smacked and the little wire breaks. Um, for PTC fuses, if the PTC fuse breaks or is open, um, it's probably something inside was damaged. So you can check. I mean, it, there could be um, a loose wire and that wire bridge something and you know, so some connector got loose, and that's what caused the short. So you want to fix that first. Kind of depends on each item. Like again, like for this, you know, when I opened it, I looked around a little bit. You know, like there was that uh, battery corrosion. Maybe you'd look, did that battery acid maybe go in and, and damage something on a circuit board or, or or cause something to short? So check that out. But for glass fuses, I would just replace the fuse. Um, they're so common. Um, and so many fuses break because of just um, mechanical reasons, not necessarily power reasons. That they didn't break because the too much current. They broke because there was a, a shaking or um, like a vibration that caused the fuse to to go. Okay. Next up, uh, question for a similar device I have that's nine volt. Is it worth it to get a buck converter if I have twelve volt wall warts in place in the battery compartment, or just to go buy a nine volt wall wart? 
Well, um, it depends a little bit, and, and this is actually, uh, it, you know, depends on the design on whether it's a direct power or there's a linear regulator in there. And I looked inside of here and it didn't look like there was any regulator. So I would hesitate to power it with anything other than nine volts. Um, that said, um, most devices are kind of okay. If you if they're said nine volts, you can kind of sort of get away with 12. It, it depends a little bit on the device, but if you, you, know, if you have a buck converter, go for it. Um, if you can get a nine volt wall adapter, I'd probably I'd probably get one. Another thing is if it was designed for use with switching adapters or for the previous uh, transformer type. If, the if it's an old device and it has like the old transformer type wall adapters, like the ones that were like, really, really heavy and like, like they felt like they were full of iron because they were full of iron, um, those float high because they're, they're usually not regulated. Um, they're usually just a, a transformer with a, um, a, a rectifier, like either a single, uh, uh, a full wave or like a, a single diode rectifier, in which case you can totally go ahead and plug in a nine volt switching adapter because nine, switching adapters are regulated output. And so like nine volts out, you're not gonna get really more than 9.5. Whereas if you're replacing something that using the big brick type, those, if you had a nine volt adapter, it would easily be as high as 14 um, unloaded. And so those devices were designed to handle much wider ranges. It's a little risky. You can always, you can always Try it if it's not. If it's already broken, it can't really damage too much more. Okay. Um, maybe for a future show, you can do how to test capacitors because they fail often. That's true. They do. Um, one thing you look for is, is check the tops. Uh, that's the, the first. Well, check the tops and look for fluid leaking out of them or um, anything bubbling out of them because that's that's the that's kind of the number one way you can tell um, that capacitors are broken. I, I I did repair something once with broken um, tantalum capacitors, and that was a pain because you can't, they dry out. And so if you have old equipment that you're turning on for the first time, you're gonna get a lot of, fail. even if it wasn't broken, it will it'll, it'll start up and break because the tantalum capacitors are dried out and they'll, they'll fail instantly. Um, but basically look for, uh, for electrolytics, look for uh, swollen tops, swollen capacitors. That's a pretty good sign. Okay, and the batteries work in the frame now? The batteries do work. It was that little corroded piece, and I kind of took a little piece of wire and I just sort of bent it around so it, it kind of skipped over the corroded piece. I made a little cover, basically, like a hook that goes over it. And the batteries work. The only thing is that um, even though I could use this with batteries, uh, I, it just eats up batteries. I don't want to have to... It, it was already having a little bit of corrosion. I don't want to leave batteries in there and have it corrode even more. I'd rather just use it off of wall power. Okay, two questions. Uh, what is the Raspberry Pi Zero Game Boy video? That's not my jurisdiction. Okay. It's not out yet, so don't ask. All right. And then um, if one of the components were not working on the green double-sided PCB, how would we find the problem? Oh, boy. That's a tough one. Um, I don't know because uh, it depends um, on what it is. Uh, so without um, making general, super 100% blame me later general statements, um, Pretty much any time something breaks, it's the power connector or the fuse. Like it's a power regulator. It's, it's almost always the power supply. Either the DC jack is the wrong size, the wrong polarity, something's cracked, um, a fuse, a busted cap. It, it's, just, it's just really rare for solid state electronics to break. It's, it's almost always the power supply. So um, if it is something on the circuit board, um, you know, you can try to trace it out. You can see if there's a transistor blown. Um, you know, maybe the motor draw. You know, it, it, the LCD lights up, but not all the segments. And you can see maybe there's a, a contact uh, loose with that ribbon cable, or some of the buttons work and some of them don't. That that can be helpful because you can see like, oh, you know, uh, cables break. It's it's almost always a mechanical thing after a power supply. So check for loose cables. Um, if there's a daughter card, daughter card became loose. That's kind of what happens. Corrosion. That's what you want to look for when we're pairing stuff. I mean, you can you can keep going, but go for the easy stuff. Okay, that's like 45 minutes. Okay. All right. So I'm going to print a label. Yeah, maybe write scan lines off or something. Scan, wait, hold Okay, hold on. So, one second. God, the hardest part is, is using this thing. Backspace. Scan, scan. Maybe there's a scan line thing. Wait, hold on. 
I know. This is the there's I don't, there's no contrast on this. Yeah, you Sorry. Can't, you can't see what you're typing. I know. Be a It'll be a surprise. Okay. Wait. There you go. Print. Yeah, this kind of has iffy contrast. And there's probably some contrast setting, but it, it's. There you go. I can now make any, any label I want. Um, now I'm going to, when you visit, I'm going to label you, so everybody knows exactly who you are and what you are. Um, but now I'm going to label all of my uh, all my cables. I'm going to label all the devices here with their HDMI timings. So, and probably I'm going to make a better cable for this. Although you never know, sometimes you know temporary cable systems, temporary cable setups are the most permanent things in the world. Yeah. All right. Well, I hope that was a good informative desk of Lady Ada. I want to have a nice and relaxing one for Sunday. Because right. then everyone's got to have a four-day weekend and go back to work. Well, well, bye, everybody. All right. See you later. I'm totally going to make all these labels now. Mm. Label.